Hi, everyone. Welcome to the second installment of our series, Research Like the Pros. With me today, Brent Donnelly, president of Spectra Markets, and Peter Bookvar, CIO of Bleakly Financial Group. Hello, gentlemen. Hi, Maggie. Hi, Brent. Hey, Peter. How are you doing? <laughs> Thanks for being with us. So, you know, we've been talking when you've been both been on, you know, over the course of really a good part of last year and into the new year that this is a really tough and at times confusing investing environment we're in, um, right? There's a lot of noise, a lot of conflicting signals. Uh, just people are really unsure, hard to see into the future. Uh, so we wanted to take the opportunity this week to take a step back and talk about the process and thinking that goes into the great analysis that you both do and help, we, help our viewers feel a little bit more confident about how they can use research to be smarter investors and maybe to deal with some of this sort of anxiety and uncertainty we all feel. Um, so we're, we're so pumped that you could be with us. It's a little different, right? We're used to meeting on the daily briefing, but I think this is going to be really fun. So why don't we start out with each of you talking a little bit about your origin story, I guess. When did you go from just being a market participant to actually kind of building your own framework and and um, and an uh, kind of an operating system, an operating research system, if you will? Brent, why don't you kick us off? When, do you remember when you kind of made that switch? Well, I do because when I started in the business, I was a market maker and it was very flow oriented. So there wasn't really much of a process required. You were more of like a robot responding to clients' flows and, and executing for them. And then as flow became automated, there was kind of this survival of the fittest thing that happened where the market makers that had a little bit more macro or risk-taking appetite survived and those that were flow-oriented struggled. And I found a lot more interesting anyways to do the, the more macro-oriented and risk-taking stuff. So it was really like a long process that that took many years because I, initially I was more focused on technicals and some simple things like that. Then I added correlation, and but then eventually correlation stopped working. So the whole process of me developing my process was really kind of an ongoing evolution that continues to this day because whatever worked two years ago doesn't necessarily mean that that's going to work two years from now. Um, so for me, that was a huge lesson as well, was the things that you're making money doing right now are almost by definition going to get discovered by the market and not be profitable later on. I'm talking about trading, of course, not investing. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's it's been an evolution. And then the, the one other thing I would say is that um, going from a bank to a hedge fund, because I worked at a hedge fund for a few years, the risk management approach is just so different and it's so much more rigorous and um, also more adaptable at a hedge fund because your capital changes. Whereas at a bank, it's it tends to be more simplistic, like don't lose this much money today or don't lose this much money in a month. Whereas at a hedge fund, you have to scale in terms of your capital, um, scaling up as you get more capital. So it's a lot more rigorous. And I learned a lot from that as well. Yeah, it's so interesting. A couple of things I want to ask you about that. But um, But Peter, what about you? I think in the, in the beginning, it was uh, really trying to figure out of what type of investor trader that I, I wanted to be. You know, like there's no one rule of thumb path to success in making money in the markets. And I, I think it's important for each individual to sort of curate a style that fits their personality and, and, and risk tolerance. Like I discovered pretty early on that after reading like market wizards, like, wow, it'd be really cool to be a trader and then tried it and realized that I wasn't any good at it. And that what I was better at was more um, longer term type thinking when it came to an investment. In other words, not something, not how something is going to play out on a data point or uh, in the next couple of weeks based on some events, but what's going to play out over multiple years. And that was just my own personal sort of style that I became comfortable with. And rather than being a market wizard, you know, I sort of tended towards like Warren Buffett's type style of thinking with extended timeframes, focusing on big picture themes and that also allowed me to sort of block out a lot of the daily noise. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And then if I had a vision of how something was going to play out, now I could have obviously been wrong with that, but if I had a thesis that I was focused on and researched and and felt that I uh, had a higher probability than 50% of playing out, then that allowed me to block out a lot of short-term influences. And if I own a company I like, whether they meet or beat earnings expectations is not necessarily going to shift my thesis. But if the fundamental backdrop of, of the business model changes, well, then that causes me a rethink. Uh, so, But it took me time and a lot of lost money to figure out like sort of what did I wanted to beat when I grew up in this business. And, uh, you know, I finally came around to a style that fit me and fit what I felt that I was better at and uh, trying to avoid what I was not good at. And that was more short-term trading. Uh, and, and that's what I've come around to. And also mm -hmm. in terms of my analysis, you know, I sort of started out as a plain vanilla, like stock picker, uh, mostly like smaller and mid cap stocks. Where I liked delving under the hood of, of a, a company's fundamentals and their situation, what their outlook is. But then, you know, sort of being in the markets, I felt like adding macro to that. And I sort of have become a macro person, but I, at heart, like to do the bottoms up as well. I felt that it was important to marry both. Like rather mm -hmm. than just being a micro person, you know, you hear some stock pickers, oh, I don't pay attention to the macro. Meanwhile, they may be buying a cyclical business. You know, Warren Buffett says, I don't pay attention to the macro, but he owns an oil company. So he does have to pay attention to the macro because that drives the fundamentals of his micro thoughts. And I felt that marrying the two together would be, uh, you know, an effective way of, of, of analyzing um, not just the economic situation, broadly speaking, but the situation of a company that you may like the stock of. So, um, and then that's yeah. what I'm to today, where I'm listening to a lot of, company conference calls of whether it's stocks we own, stocks we don't own, but to get under, you know, on the ground information, but also following the day-to-day -day macro and what a data point is here and whether it's uh, rates and monetary policy and FX and commodity prices and all that, how that ties into, uh, all ties in together. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I, I know that, I know that focus on the uh, the sort of um, underneath the hood, because we always lean on you to pull out a line from a conference call that no one heard or paid attention to because you kind of get down and dirty in the details, which we love. I, I'm interesting. I'm hearing both of you talk about um, the you can't live in a silo, right? It sounds like I mean, all of your both of your approaches have evolved, have changed, but you can't just look at one tiny slice anymore. And I I think we feel that because it's such a complicated uh, global financial system and so much is influencing um, markets. It's not just, it's not that simple anymore. I think that people kind of think that, you know, stuff and you don't, which I, which is, you know, it's very intimidating, right? They listen to you guys and they, they just think that you have some access to knowledge that, that they don't have and, and can't possibly. But what you're telling us is that this is a sort of, constant learning journey, um, which is super interesting. And both of you kind of adding on that macro later, um, I think I didn't, I didn't actually know that. And I think that's so fascinating. It gives us all hope that we can do that. And that's why we spend a lot of time talking about what's going on from a macro point of view, because you have to layer it on the individual investments. Um, Brent, you look at FX as well, um, which is interesting because, or, or a lot, I should say, talk to us about why that's important, because I think we went from a period where there wasn't go a lot going on, um, and that's changed a lot. Talk, talk to us about how foreign exchange kind of fits in the picture. Sure. I, I just want to touch on one quick thing that Peter said, because I think it's really important, is having a little bit of self-awareness as to your own personality and your style and what's going to work is really important for, for people that are newer. Uh, what I find or what I found was a lot of young people that came to the trading floor would kind of look at someone who's successful and try to copy that. And it just mm -hmm. never, ever works. What you have to do is look at multiple people who are successful, take a couple little things from one, a couple things from the other one, and then slowly create your own style. Because like, I don't have the patience to do what Peter does. And so there's no point in me trying, like my personality is much more geared towards 
you know, excitement and gambling and that kind of thing. And so I know that, and I just acknowledge that and my style reflects that. Um, in terms of the importance of FX. Wait, Brent, I just want to jump in because I think that's sure. so important. I'm glad you pointed that out because one of the things that we talk about in the academy and any of the educational things we do, one of the first modules is know what kind of investor you are. Like, why are you doing this? I'm just curious. Do you do you hear that from clients that we're they think they're one thing, but actually there's something else like, uh, or, well, or, or what they're doing. They, they want to sort of take that risk, but they're actually risk averse. I'm, I'm sure both of you come across that with the clients you deal with. Yeah. I'm laughing because I even do it myself sometimes. Like sometimes you'll see someone saying, well, Chinese demographics look really bad over the next 20 and this and that. And they're going on about balance sheet recession in China. And so I'm going to buy dollar China with a stop loss and their stop loss is like 2% away or something like that. So it's like a 20 year view with a one, <laughs> one day's range stop loss away. Um, I think matching your, your style and your view to your parameters and the structure of your trade is really important. So like if I'm doing something that's beyond about a week in duration, which is unusual because usually my trades are more like a week or less, then I'll usually do it in options because I feel like that structure will override my lack of patience uh, because it's it's a little bit, there's a little bit more of a switching cost or there's more friction to get in and out of options. So Yes, I definitely see that people have very often have a mismatch between time horizon and uh, or, or trade structure and time horizon. And the other place you'll see that sometimes is where people like Peter was saying, will analyze everything about copper and they'll say, OK, there's a shortage and there's nothing in London and this and that. But they won't look at the other side of the equation, which is usually more macro, which is the demand side. So you always have to have kind of like a top down and bottom up approach i think to anything you're looking at or you just it's just too often you'll just get run over by by some other factor that you didn't even consider so i i think having a macro look and then to your question on fx i mean fx kind of is two things one it obviously has a direct impact on say multinational earnings um, it has an impact on oil imports in Japan. Like there's a lot of macro and micro impacts, but then it's also, it also can be a barometer of capital flows. So like when the U S is the center of innovation, it's the only strong place for growth. Then, you know, that's reflected in a lot of places, not just mag seven, but also in the dollar. So I think a lot of times you can, even if you're not in an FX person, you can use FX as kind of a barometer of, of where the money's flowing because a lot of FX flows are real money. So people are buying an asset or buying, you know, buying stocks in Europe, or they're buying a company in Europe, and then they're buying euros in order to facilitate that transaction. So a lot of times I think FX is a good barometer for capital flows overall, including emerging markets and G10. Yeah, that's a great point. Peter Brandt, who's a lot of our viewers will know we have him on, a very experienced kind of veteran technician and trader. Um, one of the first interviews I did with him, he said, if I don't get the dollar right, I don't get anything right. And I and that was such an uh, sort, of sort of interesting. And and boy, did he get the dollar right that year and a lot of other things as well. Um, Peter, do you find that uh, uh, as well? That, that you, I mean, you talked about your self-awareness and journey about figuring out what you were good at. Do you feel like there's a mismatch when you're talking to clients about what they think they want and what they, you know, what they're, what they're really talking about underneath. Does that come up with you? Yeah. Well, well, my struggle always is, you know, the way, and just to add on to, you know, what Brent and I both discussed is not only do, does each person have to sort of develop their own style of investing or trading, it's also what they're comfortable buying. Some people are, are comfortable mm -hmm. sort of hopping on momentum. And saying everything's great with this company and it's going to stay great, so I'm okay buying high, in hopes of selling higher, which is fine. That may work for a period of time. I'm more comfortable looking at things through a more of a value lens and looking for more things that are bombed out. Like I'm looking at the 52-week low list when I'm looking for something to buy, rather than the 52-week high list. Uh, but that's very difficult because sometimes. I can be right on, on an investment, but it could take two years to come to fruition. Mm -hmm. Like I'm not a good market timer either where I can say, okay, this is the moment 
that things are going to inflect higher and I'm buying it at the exact bottom right before it ticks up. Unfortunately, it hasn't worked out that way for me. And mm. whereas I think that certain stories can play out sooner rather than later, sometimes it doesn't. Like I, mm. I was long uranium for years and Cameco in particular at $10 and it sat at $10 for years before it finally moved higher. So we're in a situation where a lot, you know, a lot of our clients happen to be retail and they, they see what happens with AI chip stocks and, and they see that going up and you always get the question of, you know, why do you not own that instead of something else? And where sometimes the, the time horizons of you relative to an investor are different. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, you know, the investor focuses on things that are hot while you're focused on things that are not in hopes of it will eventually get hot. I think it was Bernard Baruch saying, I'm not tr I'm trying to buy something that I find attractive that others will find attractive at some point in the future. Yeah, you get, get there early. So, and a lot of times I don't, I get there too early, but that's trying to time, you know, trying to manage the time horizon and matching that up with, with, with how you make an investment. Uh, and yeah. it doesn't always line up. And I, I always am testing my thesis and like, is this story still on track? And yes, it's taking longer than I thought, but will it eventually come around? Like my, my new trade is to be long fertilizer stocks because corn and soybean prices to me are bombed out and the positioning is very, very short. But I can't tell you when this will actually work. It could be a year before these stocks go higher and maybe they go lower before they go higher. I just feel like we've reached an extreme point where they are finally attractive and I'm not smart enough to get my timing exactly right. Whereas Brent and other short-term traders, I think they're much better at sort of timing that inflection point at which a trade would work. Mm -hmm. You know, it's but I think Peter, understanding is, the difference sorry. is important, right, Brent? Like well, there's a, there's a place for all of it. Yeah, what's interesting about what Peter said is that on this on the shorter fractal, I find the same challenge, which is, it, you know, you do you put on a trade and then it's not working, but it's not going against you because I always use stop losses, and then you you have to question like, okay, am I just bored and I'm being impatient, or is there information here? And generally if you look at the moves in the market in any market it's very concentrated into very specific periods so like you know 2 hours out of the day is going to represent the majority of the move in a currency most days and so a lot of it is there's an expression that's related to war it's something like it's it's hours of boredom punctuated by moments of terror and <laughs> trading is basically the same thing and so having even even on my shorter time horizon there still is a patience element um, obviously, time's dilated in a different way, but there still is that element of there's a lot of noise. And that's why I like trades where I know I have a specific catalyst, because, again, as an impatient person, you know, my favorite trade is to say, I've done all this analysis and I think core PCE is going to be hotter than expected. And then I put the trade on at 824 and, you know, by nine o'clock, I'm out and I'm either right or wrong and happy days. Um, and again, that's tailoring your trading style to your personality. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, th I think you, by the way, um, in addition to being an impatient person, Brent is also a fantastic writer um, and, and his notes are so entertaining and they always have more information than just markets. I learn a lot from them um, and they're great. One day we'll get into your, your, uh, your former past as a, what was it? A sketch writer, a cartoon developer. Uh, There's this whole life Brent had. Yeah. <laughs> In Canada, a fantastic. Yeah, I got a couple of lives going on. Yes, um, but and they filter through, which I I really appreciate. Um, but you you both mentioned something really important, I think, and this is something that comes up. I'm curious if you hear it from your clients. It's something comes up in the questions we get all the time, um, because of course you're always able to ask live questions, and you know we we do this on the show. Um, is people have an idea and then they're not sure if they're right, and then they're they're wondering if they should pull the ripcord. So you both have these sort of, you know, process and framework that you've built. Um, and it sounds like, I think, Peter, you said you're always testing them. Like there are going to be times when you think you're wrong. Does it help you 
developing this operating system or this framework? Does it help you keep you on the path so that you're not being whipped around by every piece of data that comes in? Because that's what happens right now to people. They hear, and we were just talking really quickly about NVIDIA before we came on air. Oh, it's oversold. It's going to sell off. And then the next person comes on. Oh, this is the, this is the, you know, the next greatest thing or Elon Musk, Tesla, another great example. I believe in Elon. He's the next coming or the stock is, you know, and, and, their heads on a swivel. They don't know who to who to listen to or what's right. It seems so conflicting. Peter, how do you how do you deal with that? And when you're, you know, what do you mean when you're always testing against your framework? Well, the, the, the one of the first questions I ask myself before I buy a stock is, are you willing to buy more if the price goes down? Now, a short-term trader. If they after they buy something, the price goes down, they likely stop themselves out. Me being a longer term investor, I say to myself, am I willing to buy more? And if the answer is yes, well, then I, I buy the stock and then I use weakness as an opportunity to buy it cheaper. And if I if it gets even cheaper, I use that as an opportunity to buy even more. Now at some point, you know, I get things wrong. And it just keeps on going down and the fundamentals don't turn out the way you think and business is more challenged or this is going to take much more time to play out where a lot of investors in the stock have a, you know, don't have the patience that you do. And then it's time to possibly reevaluate. But that's really the question I ask myself because mm-hmm. uh, I, I always think try to look at things the opposite of which the market does. And I always use the analogy that you know Walmart is the biggest private sector employer in the country because of everyday low prices that attracted people to come to their store. Where the New York Stock Exchange, when it says everyday low prices, everyone's running for the hills. And I tried to to turn that around with looking, and that's how I look for cheap stocks. And if a cheap stock gets cheaper, that's great. Um, But again, that, that comes with its own risk that you could be wrong. And the person selling it to you is smarter than you are in this particular situation. So getting to your question about testing the thesis, mm. something goes down after you buy it, you always you always need to test the thesis because you always wonder, does something somebody know something that I don't? Is someone making a smarter move than I am? And I always wanted to, to, to test that and see whether that's the case or not. Now, obviously, in, mostly in hindsight, do you determine that? But that's always part of the retesting of a thesis. Yeah. And and why you, you know, pay such close attention to so many of those details that are overlooked. And listen, we're in an environment where there's a lot of information. It's moving fast. And we talked about this yesterday with Tony and Jared, um, Warren Buffett just recently saying it the market feels more casino like than it ever has because everyone's kind of addicted to these immediate gratification 10x. Everyone's think they've got the next lock on something. So it's hard. Like the, the idea of discipline has kind of gone out the window. Um, so it's a tough environment to operate in. Brent, how do you separate out? Because you're all, I mean, you, you're you all seasoned. You've developed this framework. You developed your research process. How do you filter out what's real and what's noise, especially when you're looking more short, short-term and momentum in trading? How do you, how do you, can you tell the difference? Right. So first of all, just to address the thing of like, it's, it's harder than ever. Everyone says it's harder than ever, every year. I feel like, I feel like it's trading's never been easy. Um, But anyways, uh, (laughs) that's so true. When the algorithms came in in 2006, everyone was like, this market is ruined the algorithm. And I mean, the market just is whatever it is to me, but um, it's always hard. (laughs) Um, The thing I think that you you were talking about the different views that people have and then trying to keep up with it, all the different stories and all that. I think chasing stories is probably like the biggest leak in finance. Um, Maybe negativity bias is bigger, but chasing stories and and doing what other people are saying you should do is, is the worst possible way to trade. And so it really comes down to having your own process. So like my process is kind of around narratives, what regime we're in, positioning, correlation, and and some other things. And I mean, I think, actually, I think Jared said this first, or maybe he's quoting someone, but um, listen to many and respect few, I think is a good motto. Like you should have your own process and and you're listening to other people in order to see how they look at the world or to get information that they're looking at, but certainly not to trade their views because 
even if they're right, you don't know when they're getting in and out. You don't know when they're they're doubling down or or flipping. You know, Drucker Miller can say something on TV one day, but he might flip his position the next day, and you would you obviously would not know that. So, following other people, I think, is the worst possible process. Um, what you have to do is develop your own process, and then. So for me, I kind of have like the seven things that I look at um, and the more of those that are in line, like text and positioning and correlation and all that, then as they come into line, you know, if I get five or six out of seven, then then I can say, OK, this is a really interesting trade. And if it's three out of seven or two out of seven, then I'm, I, I know this is probably a, there's a lot of crosswinds. So for me, I'm looking for all the wind kind of blowing in the same direction and like I said, like I have those kind of seven pillars of my process, but they don't always have the same weightings. Like I used to factor technicals a lot more uh, as a trade selection tool. Now I use it just as a risk management tool. Um, correlation kind of went away because everyone's watching it. So I'm always kind of changing my process, but having, I think just knowing what your process is the first step, like writing it down and saying, okay, here's what I do. And if you, you know, if your process is I do what I buy, whatever's going up, or I listen to the people on CNBC or whatever, then, you know, if you write that down, you'll probably say, okay, this isn't a good process. You need to have your own process and follow it. And then just kind of absorb information from, from outside sources, but don't follow them. Yeah. And, and there's a place for all of it, right? I mean, there's a, 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 a knowing who you are is helpful, but all of you take input from different places. And I love the idea of writing it down because we know, I mean, we've done sessions with Denise and, um, you know, taking a look at people who are really struggling. And when they say they have a process, then suddenly you're like, wait a minute, but do you really? Because when they're, when they have to list it, then it starts to get a little bit unclear. And so that that's, I think, really important. Peter, how do you blend, um, fundamentals and technicals and sentiment. How do you think about all of those in the pot when you, when you're talking about your framework? So for the, the technicals, you know, because I, I have a longer term time frame, is I look at charts every single day, but it's more just giving me perspective and, uh, on that particular security, whether it's a, a stock or the price of gold or the price of oil, just so I can see where, where we've been, how we got here, what were some of the influences that resulted in these big moves up and down? Uh, so it, it, it's that perspective. I'm not a good chart reader. Now, I've gotten better over the years just because you've been doing this long enough. You you sort of recognize certain chart patterns, but I'm very basic when it comes to that. Uh, so, yeah, I can read a head and shoulders top and a head and shoulders bottom. And, you know, usually that, that, that helps me. But more of the complicated stuff, uh, I, I leave it to others. Uh, so I, I think it's just, it's just constantly reading and reading and doing more reading about the things that would influence, uh, the things that you own and the things that you're looking at. And, you know, they just, just, it's, the world is just one big cobweb with so many things, uh, intertwining that, um, you just have to be up to speed on all this. And it's not just five days a week, nine to five, and then you go home and then it's over, particularly when you're trading FX, when it's, it's around the clock, you know, this is something that you just, you have to be on top of seven days a week and all the time and keep keeping up to speed with the news, because yeah. it's amazing how one thing on this side of the world can somehow make its way to the other side of the world. And you just have to, you know, be able to try to connect those dots. And can yeah, I jump and in you, for and, two seconds? Yeah. Maybe? And you both look globally too, which I wanted to, I wanted to mention. Yeah, please jump in, Brent. Um, so one interesting thing there too, I think, is that one analogy that that someone said one time is that technicals are kind of like driving by looking in the rear view mirror. Like you kind of have a sense of where the road is. It's not like completely impossible, but it's mostly backward looking with like maybe a little bit of, you know, you have a sense of where the road is, but you don't know when it's turning. And I think that's a useful analogy. It gives you a really, texts give you a really good idea of of where you've been and a vague idea of where you're going, but on their own, I don't think they work in isolation. Yeah. Uh, it, it strikes me. So you both, you both look at the global picture, um, as well. And it strikes me that when you're talking about diversification, um, you know, the, the idea we've had a lot of discussions about 60, 40, right. What's the, what's the, you know, do, do bonds have a role? What should you be doing in terms of assets? But we don't often talk about 
uh, global diversification. We don't often talk about diversification from a time horizon, right? Do I have short-term trades I feel strongly about? What What am I doing you know, for my longer term trades. I know many of you work it that way. And sometimes you have your trading book. I mean, Tony Greer talks about this. I have my trading book and then I have my other book, like my long-term book. It's just that he tends to talk about his trading book with his with his clients more. Um, how how do you both personally think about time horizon? Do you do you look short term and long term, even if it's not in your research? How do you how do you think about that? Both Brent and Peter, if you could tell us that. Sure, I'll go quick because my answer is pretty short. So, what I've found is that the the views tend to get commingled. So, like the worst case scenario is you're short term bullish, the thing goes down, and then you decide, oh, this trade is now an investment, and I'm long term bullish. So that tends to be a thing that happens. And also for me, I just feel like I have no edge in the long run. I know what my edge is in the short run, and and I just try to maximize that. Um, so I'm really focused on one time horizon, and I think. It takes a very specific kind of mind to be able to separate the two time horizons and do well in both. Mm. And most people, I think, are good at one, but very few can do both successfully. I think, uh, Peter, why do I have a feeling you're going to agree? I, no, I totally agree. I mean, I, I, you know, I mentioned earlier that, you know, I'm not, I, I'm, I'm usually too early with things, and sometimes I have to sit with things for a while before they work out. I mean, I still look for catalysts, whether it's a management change at a company. You know, I mentioned earlier with corn and soybeans, we have the, the largest net short position on record. Like, but that nece- doesn't necessarily mean that prices are going to reverse just like that. Mm-hmm. But, but I, but I am looking for a catalyst. I just don't always find the right ones or or, or get it right. Uh, you know, I, I think a lot of it is, you know, you sort of trial by error in a way. But you know, you you do this long enough, you you know which are the more influential factors that drive something and what's noise. Yeah. Brent knows when there's a big event or a big number or, or something that's notable that can move a currency rather than something, yeah, there's something coming out, but it's really, it's usually a, a non-market moving non-event. Therefore I'm not going to play. And, and, you know, that, that's sort of, you know, a lot of that is just experience and seeing, over time, what matters. I mean, it's also with like geopolitics. I mean, mostly speaking, geopolitics is a very short-term influencing type event that lasts sometimes days or tops weeks. Uh, it's it's very rare to have a long-term influence. Now, of course, now when um, something can get drawn out and, and you can wake up any day with Ukraine and Russia and you know some pipeline gets blown up or mm. um, something happens with with the delivery of oil in in the red sea whatever that can be hugely disruptive where geopolitics has a major influence but it's few and far between that that's the case and trying to figure out what what sort of goes away and ends up being noise and what is what is a real factor that can drive things not just in the short term but over a period of time yeah i think that that's absolutely true it it does take a lot of experience to do that and I feel like that when I talk to you, you know, you, these conference calls can go on for a really long time and there's a lot of information in them and stuff. And and yet you'll pull out something that none of us paid attention to and bring it up in a call that it can affect other things as well. And so that that's that ability to kind of like grab onto the really salient points and the really th- the p- things that are important and leaning forward um, are going to give you a, a sort of hook for the future. I think it's so it's hard, but it's really valued. Um, so. So what if we sort of wrap it up and leave folks with something to think about, because again, this is sort of part of, we, we really kind of lean into the education part and trying to help people not just sort of consume content, but think about how they can build a framework to operate off of. So they feel more confident. They have the tools they need to make a decision that's right for them. And it's going to, it's, we're going to require a little bit of everything, right. But just, just feeling more confident in the process. Um, because there's such a big hurdle and it sounds like everybody knows what they're talking about, but you sometimes, um, what's the one sort of piece of advice or hack or something you've gained from leaning on research that you'd like to leave people with? What's a thought we should leave them with as they kind of, you know, continue on their journey, on their investing journey, Brent? Well, this kind of relates to what Peter said, but a lot of times people say, where do you find your trade ideas? And really Mostly, I find the trade ideas kind of come to me. Um, and the reason is 
I have my process and I know kind of what I'm looking for. And then I'm just curious and I read a lot of, I read a ton of stuff and I follow everything. I read all the central bank speeches and, and so on. And so there's this kind of like osmosis concept that Peter is, is talking about where you just read a lot, absorb a lot of information and connections start happening in your brain. And of course, it's not going to happen the second year that you're in the market. Um, but I think just being very uh, sort of intentionally curious and and following the the rabbit holes, you know, if you read something, then dig deeper into it and just follow all the rabbit holes. And then you not only will you learn the information that you're learning from doing that, you'll also learn what you're interested in and and which rabbit holes you really are interested in pursuing because ultimately you have to be I, my opinion is you have to mostly be doing it as a person that wants to solve puzzles and have fun and enjoy it mm -hmm. and the money and and you know performance should be secondary in my opinion because ultimately it's a it's a pretty interesting and fun pursuit and that's intrinsic drive i think is more powerful than the extrinsic drive of of money yeah it's a great point and listen that knowledge lends itself to a lot of other aspects of life too there's an intersection of all this um i have certainly found as somebody who did not intend on talking about <laughs> finance as much as i do uh peter what about you i, I really i couldn't have said it any better uh than how brent laid it out uh i'll just say like i think just important to follow and and follow what you understand and know like understand a situation understand a thesis uh if you're going to invest in it like i'll never own a biotech stock because that's just over my head uh even like a lot of parts of technology are just over my head and while i can be pitched and i can read about this great story this 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 great cure for some disease or this fast chip that's going to do this, this, or that. For some people that understand it, great for them. I, that's just not for me. So just really focus on things that you understand. And to what we talked about throughout the call is matching your interests and the things that you can grasp with the type of personality and trading style that fits you, not somebody else, but fits you and what you're comfortable with. You know, some people they buy a stock, it goes down a dollar, and they and they and they panic. Well, maybe short term trading is not for them. Others that don't get bothered by it, they think bigger picture. Okay, well then maybe that style is for you. There's no one one right way of making money in markets. Yeah, absolutely. You're both incredibly humble uh, because you're both so excellent at what you do. Um, but I think it's really helpful for people to hear the learning journey that you've been on and the difficulties and the fact that you acknowledge that you're not good at everything, um, I think is, is really generous of you both because it, it's really helpful. Because I said, I think there's a lot of barriers in this. Um, we see it in the questions we get from people and they're really intimidated. Um, but this part of the process, it is a learning journey um, and, and it can be fun um, and it is accessible to people. So we appreciate you always both kind of coming with your knowledge and sharing it. We love the fact that you're part of the RV marketplace. Um, we appreciate that. Um, and just, you know, being able to extend what you know to help people along. Um, it's confusing out there. So we appreciate that from you guys. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, Maggie. Hey, yeah. Thanks for having us. Thanks, it was Peter. Fun. It's fun. These, guys, these two guys hang out. They know each other too. So it's fun to get them both on the program at the same time. Next time we'll have to do an AMA. You can pile in and ask them a bunch of questions. Sure. And that's the other thing. For me, reading all of your research, listening to you guys, doing the shows with you, um, even if I just know the smarter question to ask, right? I may not be at the answer, but I'm getting better at asking smart questions to my advisor when I'm thinking about what I need to do for my family. And that's what we're all trying to get to, just that next level. You don't get right to the top, but we're trying to just keep climbing up. So we appreciate it. Thanks, guys. We'll see you soon. Thanks to all of you. We'll be back tomorrow with Paul Hodges and Gio Chen for the continuation of this series. And we'll be back with the daily briefing today. Take care and good luck out there.